that already. We have a white supremacist criminal justice system. I don't know why people get some triggered by the sentiment, okay? Greetings, Internets. In this video, I will be making the argument that the socialist Twitch streamer Hassan Piker, also known as Hassan Abi, Hassan Abi, Cenk Uyghur's nephew, genuinely has absolutely no idea what he is talking about, and is completely clueless in regards to economics and world affairs. Now, I know that may come across as extremely harsh and bad faith, but I assure you this is a completely serious and honest assessment, and I intend to objectively show why this conclusion is fair and reasonable. The thing is, much of Hassan's content follows very predictable patterns, and tactics he uses to avoid honestly addressing whatever subject it is that he is babbling on about. And when you learn to spot said patterns and the kind of content he makes, it becomes fairly easy for the average person to see through this nonsense. And as it turns out, Hassan is not the only person guilty of this type of snarky, irrational reaction content. Therefore, this video will not just be about Hassan, but also about this particular style of pseudo-intellectualism in general. I hope with this video, more people will become aware of this style and come to see why it's a total grift, so that it can be more easily called out for the juvenile kind of content that it is, and why it should never be taken seriously by anyone. Let's start by looking at Hassan's style of responding to other people's videos, which relies heavily on fallacies of relevance. When Hassan makes an attempt to debunk someone else's video content, he will generally follow a simple three-step formula. First, he will pause the video he was responding to before it has made its central point clear. Second, he will then refute the incomplete statement, generally by spewing some completely unrelated bullshit and rarely ever addressing the central core of their argument. Optionally, he may also throw in some socialist or other partisan talking points in order to make himself look smart to the people who already agree with him. He will then repeat this process until he can pretend like he has won. The way this grift works is that by only ever responding to half a statement, he can avoid making it too obvious that he doesn't actually understand anything that is being said by the person he is responding to. It's a method that lets him substitute objective reason for snarky gotchas. Of course, the problem with this type of content from a rational standpoint is that the counter-arguments Hassan produces this way are almost always completely irrelevant to the subject. Let's now look at a few examples of this in action, starting with Praxben. He's deranged ANCAP. If America loves democracy so much, why don't we have democracy in the workplace? Like, we love freedom, but when we go into work, we just start taking orders from someone, no questions asked? How about the workers choose their managers rather than the other way around? How about when management is coming up with policies that directly affect the worker? Why don't the workers have a say in creating those policies? Okay, so the first guy is classic. This is like, first guy is a Richard Wolf Andy, okay? I already know. Of course, I don't personally disagree with that take. I agree with it, but it's a classic Richard Wolf Andy. Let's see what he has to say though this guy this guy looks like he's about to intellectually dismantle him okay this is incredibly stupid first of all logically just because something affects you doesn't mean you should have a say in it if 50 people wait what just because logically bro you can't just say logically and then say whatever the f you want after it and then people will be like well that guy is logical <laughs> See, logically, unicorn should exist just like the free market. It does. Oh my God, he has his IQ. Oh no. Oh no. I'm Ben, IQ 137. Oh no. So right at the start of the video, we have our classic step one and two. He pauses the video just as Praxman is about to make a logical argument, and then Hassan claims that it's not a logical argument. Well, of course, what Praxman just said is not a logical argument because he hasn't made the argument yet because Assad paused in the middle of it. No shit, Sherlock. He then spews some irrelevant nonsense and personal insults before unpausing. What does Praxpen's IQ of 137 have anything to do with this video or the point it makes? Nothing. Absolutely no relevance whatsoever. Already we are seeing why Hassan's style of content is not to be taken seriously. Not only is there zero attempt by Hassan at good faith here, he hasn't even attempted to understand what Praxpen has to say before babbling on about it. You will not be the factory owner. You will not be enslaving others. You will be my slave. And then I will be Elon Musk's slave, okay? Please stop thinking that in an ANCAP deregulated uh, society that, that you will thrive in that society. You will not, okay? If you're not thriving in this situation, you're not thriving in that one. People walk into my home now just because they're going to be affected by the conditions of my house. That does not mean that they get a say in what I do. It is- Wait, what? Uh, no, they absolutely do get a fucking- that, That's literally not true. That's why there's like zoning restrictions and, and uh, like for example, if you have- uh, if you have your friends that come over to your house and they have children and they fall into your fucking pool and die, like you're absolutely liable for that, for not putting up a fucking pool gate, okay? So 
Again, pausing and spewing nonsense. This time Hassan completely fails to understand the point of what Praxman is saying. Praxman was making something known as a reductio ad absurdum, which is a valid form of a logical argument where you show why something makes no sense by showing how belief in it results in an absurd conclusion. The statement was made that you should have a say in whatever happens to affect you. So Praxman responds by pushing that statement to its absurd conclusion that people should have a say in how someone else's house is run just because they walk into that house. Another way of putting it would be to look at the US military. Should a grade E1 private have a say in the decisions made by a first lieutenant that affect him? Of course not. Because the entire point of military ranks is that people with more knowledge and experience should be higher up the chain of command since their decision making skills have proven more effective at not getting people killed for stupid reasons. The point being made here is that many decisions are best made on positions of merit. Therefore the claim that a person should always have a say in everything around them is completely ridiculous. And Hassan completely fails to grasp this point, instead opting to give an alternative scenario where you would have some say in what happens to you, but that's not the point of the argument at all. Providing a counterexample to a reductio ad absurdum doesn't automatically disprove the point that it makes. If Hassan had at least actually studied how critical thinking works sometime in his life, he would know this, but since he clearly hasn't, the argument completely flies over his head. Now I could go on and point out the further irrelevancies of his response to Praxman if it can even be called a valid response, but it's pretty much just an endless pattern of Hassan failing to properly address any argument he makes while regurgitating random socialist talking points. So let's move on to another example. It feels like every bread tuber has to take blind swings at Dr. Jordan Peterson. They legitimately cannot help themselves. So here we are. I knew this guy, he'd been in a motorcycle accident and it really ruined him and he was like a linesman, you know, working on the power and he was working with someone who had Parkinson's disease and they had complementary inadequacies. Two of them could do the job of one person and so they're out there fixing power lines in the freezing cold despite the fact that one was three quarters wrecked with a motorcycle accident and the other one. He's talking about a society that does not adequately take care of its people, of its disabled workers while simultaneously loving how awesome it is that these people who are like up have to still work. They are so up that it is hard for them to complete the work of one person. And yet they are still out in the freezing cold. By the way, this is a, a, a classic that happened uh, type story where it's not true. Like, it's just like, that's definitely a fake ass story. But the fake story he chose to and tell is still one that is like horrifying a normal human being with like a shred of empathy would hear this and go this is psychotic those people should be pursuing other things that are not physical they should be able to have fulfillment elsewhere society or a functioning competent government should take care of those people capitalism is poggers because people with late stage parkinson's disease still have to do hard labor to survive this response by Hassan once again follows the pattern of responding to an incomplete point followed by incoherent socialist snark. It's particularly bizarre this time around because if you actually watch the original video from Dr. Peterson, it's not even really about capitalism or socialism at all, but about how reality is harsh, nature is cruel, and one way to deal with the difficulties of how the universe unforgivingly operates is through self-improvement and strong ethics. It's more of a philosophical point than anything else. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit, and that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. So you think, well, what do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Well, who wants to admit that? Well, just think about it. Well, so what do you do in the face of that suffering? Try to reduce it. Start with yourself. What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies, you're not whining away in a corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. So the snip Hassan is responding to here is completely taken out of context. It's a seven minute video. Feel free to watch it all for yourself if you want. Hassan's socialist dribble here has almost nothing to do with what Dr. Peterson is talking about. But just for fun, let's pretend for a moment that it does. Hassan's argument here is basically the classic grift that presupposes socialism would do a better job providing people a higher quality of life than market economies. Because as we all know, people having to work in harsh conditions never happened in Stalin's Russia or Mao's China. This is of course completely untrue. There are numerous studies that have proven that the freer the market, the higher the people's quality of life. 
So the only way Hassan's reasoning makes sense here is if he is talking about a utopian ideal of socialism, which therefore follows the same reasoning error that every utopian argument makes that it may be true in theory, but useless in practice. For instance, you could say, Hey kids, I've got a great idea. How about we all agree to just stop doing bad things? Yeah, man, if nobody did any bad things anymore, then the world would be a happy land paradise. I'm so smart, why didn't anyone else ever think of such a simple solution? Everyone sing kumbaya and stop doing bad stuff. While well, this kind of statement is correct in theory, it's obviously not feasible, and therefore just complete juvenile feel-goodism. Yeah, sure, if the government was perfect and didn't ever fall to corruption, and perfectly took care of people who were suffering, society would be better. But in reality, government corruption increases with its power, so Hassan's argument here is nothing more than just wishful thinking and infantile nonsense. But what else does he have to say? In the cold. That's how our civilization works. It's like. There's all these ruined people out there, they've got problems like you can't believe. Off they go to work and do things they don't even like, and look, the lights are on. This is yet another instance, like, we're watching those, like, get-rich-quick scammers describe how a fundamentally broken system works, but they say it with, like, a, like a positive association. So, you are left to believe that this is a positive thing, but because it's actually true, uh, the thing that they're saying, uh, if you have a shred of empathy, you hear that and you go, that's fucking psychotic. That's not good. That's bad. You described wage slavery and how people who are like fucking forced to do hard labor to keep your shitty fucking lights on Again, if you had watched the full clip of what Dr. Peterson meant, it becomes obvious that Hassan's response has very little to do with it. It's like he just prepares canned pro-socialist responses and tries to fit them into whatever he is responding to. That's pretty much what we are seeing here. Dr. Peterson's point that we should be grateful for human perseverance is completely missed in favor of capitalism bad because people have to work. Reality check. People also have to work under socialism, and under generally worse conditions. Until we reach a technological singularity where robots can do all jobs better than humans can, there are jobs that just have to get done that people will have to do regardless of what political or economic system they are living under. So once again, Hassan's reasoning here is just completely missing the point, irrelevant utopian nonsense. The rest of his video on Dr. Peterson doesn't get any better, so let's just move on to the final example of Hassan's response video style, this time featuring Tim Poole. It was like there's like a political message in Squid Game. Yeah, the writer, at least that's what he said. My takeaway from it was communism bad. That was my takeaway from it. The creator called it a fable for uh, modern day capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, but also for life <clears throat> and the competitiveness of life. Uh, and that message, I, it's, it's not subtle at the end. Nothing is more cancerous than watching someone give light spoilers or fucking full-blown spoilers about a show that was like insanely popular that everyone and their mothers watched. But being on the internet and like having to discuss it or watch it on a Twitch stream, it's, it's literally just like, it makes me want to fucking video game myself. Like, we get it, bro. You didn't watch it. Most likely you're not intending to watch it. I, wanna, I, I think it's really stupid that oh that it's so like overtly it's not even an undertone it's like so overtly anti-capitalist oh yes the squid game debate over whether it makes capitalism look bad or communism look bad I briefly mentioned this in Refuting BreadTubers episode 1 featuring Vosh. I suppose now is as good of time as any to explain this in more depth. The basis of the discussion is that Squid Game is showing problems caused by too much power in the hands of the few, while people in the bottom have to fight for their lives just to scrape by. And the people with power exploit their power and take sadistic pleasure in watching the struggle of those less fortunate. In other words, Squid Game's general narrative can be interpreted as an allegory for social issues caused by monopolies and corruption. Now, the issue here is that capital Capitalism actually does a better job at preventing monopolies and corruption than socialism does, because there is one big monopoly that socialists completely avoid when talking about this subject, the state. If the state ends up owning everything, then this is by definition the biggest monopoly you can possibly have, as well as being the ultimate form of corporatist corruption. And the thing is, this is exactly what happens when socialism is pushed to its logical conclusions. Communal ownership of the means of production really just means that whoever has bureaucratic power controls the means of production. Which is why whenever communism is seriously attempted, it always ends in state ownership of the means of production, which results in one of the most corrupt and most monopolistic societies in terms of power dynamics that can possibly exist. This is basically why Tim Poole is saying that Squid Game is actually a critique of communism, because communism's logical conclusion is state ownership, which history has proven. 
For anyone watching this video that is new to the socialism versus capitalism debate, this is possibly the biggest reason of all that socialism doesn't work. The very definition of socialism, defined by socialists as common ownership of the means of production and distribution, is not actually an achievable goal without authoritarian control. Socialists have never come up with a good answer to this problem. Oh, they have certainly tried, of course, but their answers all fall flat. Everybody wears the same clothes. They have limited access to anything. They get garbage food every day. They're like, okay, the game's over. Here's the food you get. And they get trash. Yeah. And they're fighting each other because they're starving. That to me is an indictment of communism. And if this guy who made the show is actually like, it's, it's actually capitalism that's bad. I'm like, it just goes to show this is a person who made a great show, but was really dumb and didn't understand they were actually critiquing. Wait. So he's saying the show is actually about communi uh, uh, communism, not capitalism. And even if the creator himself says that, then even then he's wrong. I love that carve out that he did where he just like, he basically was like, I know I'm fucking wrong, but it doesn't matter. The creator himself and his artistic vision is also possibly wrong. If I get owned down the line, I'll have an out. I'll simply state that I was right. Easy. Bye bye. I win. What a fucking grueling, pathetic little baby way of looking at now, Hassan's response to this is one of the worst I've ever seen. He neglects to meaningfully respond to the subject of Tim Pool's implied point, instead opting to simply restate that the creator of Squid Game says it's a valid critique of capitalism, therefore it just is. Think about this rationally for a moment. For instance, if a flat earther makes a movie and claims that his story proves the earth is flat, but upon watching the movie it includes a bunch of geometric data that when examined actually proves the earth is round. Does this movie prove the earth is flat because the creator claims so, or does it prove the earth is round because the data shows so? Obviously the latter. Just because a person intends for their artistic work of fiction to serve as an allegory to prove point X doesn't magically mean it successfully proves point X. Again, this is very basic critical thinking skills. So what Hassan is saying here is effectively just claiming that Squid Game is a critique of capitalism because the creator says so, and because the creator says so, the critique is automatically, magically valid. This is a circular argument, and for that reason, there really isn't any value in going further into Hassan's response to Tim Pool on Squid Game. It's just more bad takes built on this faulty foundation. To conclude this section, here are some other examples of this type of pause, spew bullshit, repeat, claim victory style of content from Hassan. Feel free to watch them yourself and see if you can spot how often his responses have little to do with the central argument he is responding to. Alternatively, you can look at other leftist streamer bros like Vosh or Xanderhal, as they both produce a similar style of content with this pattern of pause, spew nonsense, repeat. Now this next section represents a far bigger problem, leftist racism. Another pattern of the type of far-left, unresearched streamer bro content Hasanabi creates, and possibly the most dangerous problem with it, is a strong tendency to partake in race baiting and what some like to call leftist racism, especially when the facts are against these streamers. This is a common problem with BreadTube in general, so I'll first start by explaining the issue in detail. For those who do not know, leftist racism is a form of racial discrimination that tries to frame itself as improving equity, diversity, and inclusion between collective groups. You can think of it as racial discrimination against the individual, with the lame excuse given that said discrimination is somehow justified because it will supposedly improve collective equity. Spoilers, it usually doesn't. And evidence has actually been mounting in recent years that this type of discrimination actually increases racial distrust and has an overall negative impact on race relations. It serves as no surprise then that many leftist racists are also Marxists or follow some form of socialist ideology. The guiding philosophy of collective equality behind this form of racism is fundamentally the same garbage. Now, leftist racism generally follows a concept known as the progressive stack. And just to prove I am not strawmanning this, I will use the definition written by leftists on Wikipedia. The progressive stack is a technique used to give marginalized groups a greater chance to speak. It is sometimes an introduction to or a stepping stone to consensus decision making in which simple majorities have less power. The technique works by allowing people to speak on the basis of race, sex, and other group membership, with preference given to members of groups that are considered the most marginalized. In other words, the value of what you have to say is not based on your individual experience or merit, but where they decide to subjectively rank you based on your group identity's victimhood points. For the most part, in the United States, they rank Western European Americans in first place and East Asian Americans in second place. Thus, most leftist racism will usually target one of these two groups, usually the former, but sometimes the latter too. An example of this in action would be wanting to end higher education programs for students that are ahead in math because too many of them are either white or Asian. Oh no. And we're thus creating racial inequity. So therefore, these white and Asian kids' futures must be sacrificed to the god of DEI. This, unfortunately, 
unfortunately is not a hypothetical example. Yeah, they actually did that. When leftist racism is called out, they will typically try to argue that racism is prejudice plus power or other forms of arguing semantics and equivocation. Therefore, insults like this... Did I say, oh my god, saltine cracker, like people are just bitter because it's saltine cracker. That's not what I, that's not what I said, you dumb cracker bitch are magically not racist because, you know, changing the definitions magically changes the properties. But in all seriousness, this insane concept has been refuted in extreme detail by PSA Sitch a while back. Or sometimes, they will just flat out say that what they are doing is somehow a good thing due to their inability to comprehend that it's logically impossible to rationalize aggressive identity politics for one group without also justifying it for groups you don't like. It'd pull for we, but not for thee. Alternatively, they will fling baseless accusations at people they disagree with of being a fascist bigot or something. Kind of like this. Floors lol. Anti-cracker mental gymnast gymnastics. You're insulting someone based on their race. Insulting someone based on their race is racist. By calling someone a cracker, you're being racist. Pro-cracker mental gymnastics. No roaches were slave owners. Honkies. This is payback to, for those tidy whities Honkies invented racism. Bro, this is like straight up like a fucking... This is like a Nazi meme, bro. <laughs> what the... There is obviously nothing remotely fascist about a meme explaining why racial discrimination is wrong. The only thing he doesn't like about this is the specific group it's talking about. You could easily just replace the identity groups in this meme with identity groups that the far left actually likes, and Hasanabi would be defending the meme without changing anything else about it. But of course, psychological projection is just another feature, not a bug, of leftist racism, so these brilliant double standards are not surprising at all. So let's look at some more examples of this in action. We will start with his take on Kyle Rittenhouse. Bebo replied to me. Oh, he did. He said, well, there it is, the Rittenhouse precedent. That precedent is called self-defense, and it has been central to every single legal regime in human history. <laughs> oh, there it is, boys. The precedent is called self-defense. No way, dude, is it? That's crazy. America do be kind of broken. I mean, it is. We knew that already. We have a white supremacist, criminal justice system. I don't know why people get so f triggered by the sentiment, okay? Obviously, there is a f load of leniency offered to, especially a young wannabe cop, conservative kid who f shot literally uh, people that were there uh, during a f BLM protest. So yeah, and if you consider that to be uh, ridiculous, if you consider that sentiment to be ridiculous, then, you know, shut the fuck up, plus you're white, plus ratio, plus you never even fell up so that you could fell off. I'm just saying, like, the idea that, like, people's attitudes are not remarkably different when when the person that, like, is on trial is literally, like, a white person. I'm sure this will shock this barely even needs to be refuted because of how blatantly insane it is. Ah yes, Kyle Rittenhouse being found not guilty had nothing to do with the fact that there was video evidence proving he acted in self-defense, multiple witnesses of Rosenbaum's aggressive behavior, or Grosskreet's broken and deceptive testimony. In the mind of the lefty racist, Rittenhouse is You're a fucking white, white male, and so clearly is only getting off as a product of his whiteness, evidence, and facts be damned. The overwhelming evidence proving his innocence does not matter to them. This is very common when it comes to leftist racism. Mental gymnastics are played to avoid looking at the evidence in any case that they have decided is racially charged. This is further shown by how he later in the video repeats some of the bogus partisan media talking points, he crossed state lines, or he was 17, two things that have been proven irrelevant several times to the case. Next, let's look at his take on racial slurs. A lot of this is going to be in the F category, I feel like. Right here, now we're getting, now we're heating up. Cracker. I mean, you know what my take is. Uh, <laughs> we can't put this at, as an F. It has some context. It has some history yeah. of, uh, of you know, be, of usage. Cracker. I mean, that's got to be at least a D, right? Okay. I mean, if you say so. You, I think, you I guess it, it's you like a, I guess F. it's higher. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely gotta higher, be than, higher like, than fish belly. belly. Yeah, it's it's a little bit higher than that for sure. Yeah, cracker. It, it has the capacity for like people to be legitimately offended uh, by it, even if they're in the margins. You know what I mean? Like someone yeah. could be like, "Oh, well, that's really fucking mean. That hurts my feelings." Like I can see that. I think that should be a C. The whole argument over what is most offensive has always been an irritating one because the very concept of being offended is subjective. Anyone can subjectively claim that a word is the most painfully offensive thing ever, and anyone can subjectively claim that it's not offensive. You can't really make a concrete argument out of this either way. So instead, I'll just explain what's wrong with the slur cracker since it has flown over these two guys' heads. 
Cracker, as the term is used today, don't even get me started on the brain-dead genetic fallacy put forth by MTV, generally refers to the crack of the whip of a slave over from the American 1800s. Thus, calling someone a cracker is basically associating them with slavery. This obviously has negative connotations as slavery gained infamy as one of mankind's greatest evils, as most people today agree it is and was a bad thing. So when a white person is called a cracker, they are basically being told that they are guilty for the evil of their ancestors. Or in other words, cracker when directed at a white person is just a roundabout way of instilling white guilt and or saying white people bad, via guilt by association. So yes, it can be considered a racially charged insult to call someone a cracker. Next, let's look at some race baiting with the CEO of Parler. A free speech crackdown. Amazon Web Services dropping Parler from its cloud services late last night following Google and Apple banning the app from their app stores. This coordinated move from big tech and social media could effectively take Parler offline permanently and run the company out of business. Joining me right now is the CEO of Parler, John Mates, joining me on the telephone. John, thanks very much for calling in this morning. How are you doing this morning? Can you tell us what has taken place? Thank you, Maria. Um, well, it's uh, it's an interesting morning, I guess, to say the least. You know, I never thought we'd be living in a country, you know, where things like this would happen, where you could get coordinated companies canceling your, uh, you know, what you're doing. I mean, essentially, the, the site is... Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Maria Bartiromo, and on the line with me is the president of racism, Mr. CEO of racism. We found it. He's on the line right now. So this represents a particularly dangerous guilt by association fallacy that is often pushed by race baiters. This idea that supporting a free speech absolutist platform of ideology is racist because it allows racism. This is of course a fallacious argument because allowing a person's speech does not mean you agree with their speech. This has been pointed out many times. It's also an extremely dishonest form of emphasis. A free speech platform is all encompassing. So to say that something that is all encompassing is bad because of the cherry pick examples of whatever bad things they can find in it ignores the reality that you can find everything in it. The idea that free speech absolutism is racist is therefore completely absurd. The issue always comes down to the problem that there is no way to objectively define hate speech. So what is defined as hate speech at any given moment will always be subject to interpretation from the people in charge deciding what is and what isn't allowed. Ironically, this means the official understanding of what is considered hate speech is dictated by those with power at the top, completely the opposite of what people who are in support of the progressive stack supposedly would want. I'm sure that's a power that could never, not in a million years, find itself being abused. It's not like such a power has ever been abused in history before, except for, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of times that it has. Yeah. Lastly, here are some honorable mentions. Hassan whining about the Canadian trucker rally because they are too white, and his claim that the big reason Western countries are supporting Ukraine is because they are white. And again, this type of content can be found in most other far-left streamers as well. Race baiting and leftist racism unfortunately provides a very compelling argument to normies who are not aware of how manipulative this tactic can be because it's always framed from the position of victimhood. As a final note, they will occasionally try to brand this type of racism as anti-racism. Yeah, don't fall for that one either. It's about as honest as branding a matchbox as anti-fire. Now for the last section, partisan propaganda. The final issue I'll be going over that exists in the political streamer bro style of content Hasanabi makes is the information coming from this kind of content is generally completely based on hot takes, meaning that it requires a decent level of education and knowledge in the topics they are responding to in order for their information to be correct because they're doing it on the spot. Now that wouldn't be too bad if they actually had decent reasoning skills and decent knowledge of these subjects, but out of these three the smartest of them would probably be Vosh and Vosh isn't exactly a genius himself. So that puts this type of edgy socialist streamer bro content creator in a bit of a bind. How can they convince hundreds of thousands of people that they know what they are talking about despite themselves being a bunch of midwits? Well, there's a simple tactic they can follow. They regurgitate partisan nonsense from leftist journalists. This way they can get a huge audience of people who already agree with them and are thus unlikely to notice their constant reasoning errors and misinformation via the magic of confirmation bias. For some examples of this, I'll first start with Hasanabi's misinformation on spending and inflation. If free money were the answer, if money really grew on trees, why not give more free money? Why not give it out all the time? Why stop at $600 a person? Why not $1,000? Why not $2,000? Here's how you shut Rand Paul the fuck up, dude. 
anytime a libertarian tries to tell you like oh man these deficits dude these deficits they're crazy remind them that Rand paul voted for one of the largest deficit uh increasing tax cuts in american history the only reason why this fucking spaghetti haired brittle bone dipshit is talking about uh you know our deficits and talking about modern monetary theory like is he saying that the republicans are fucking woke with how much money that they're giving to people the only reason why he's fucking doing that is because poor people get money now well Whoa. the federal government brought in 3.3 trillion last year and spent 6.6 .6 trillion the deficit last year a record busting 3.3 trillion dog you literally voted for it like what are you saying you fucking asshat like he is acting like this happened in a in a uh you know in a vacuum and he had no say on the matter bitch you gladly voted for the fucking tax cuts what's up the coffers are bare we have no rainy day fund we have no savings account Congress has spent all the money. No one's talking about inflation when it comes to quantitative easing. We're not talking about inflation when it comes to fucking printing like trillions to, to stop the market from fucking crashing. Inflation only matters when it comes to giving the poor's money. And the real reason why it matters when you're giving the poor's money is because this is about enforce. It is about making sure that someone's still cleaning the toilet. That's the real reason. That's precisely why so many fucking uh, Ron Paul included so many Republicans were like, you know, what's the real stimulus getting back? to work. OK, so this right here is why you want to get your understanding of economics from books, actual economist coursework and data analysis, not from repeating partisan talking points from Vanity Fair. That is just a leftist cultural magazine with writers who make zero attempts to distinguish facts from their own personal opinion. The causes of inflation are fairly well understood. Too much money chasing too few goods, the relation of GDP and money velocity, and spurred on by government spending due to printing of more money. Economists are always talking about inflation when it comes to printing money, and quantitative easing is almost always mentioned alongside inflation since it involves central banking targeting certain levels of monetary supply. Also, if the government gives tax cuts, but then does trillions of dollars of deficit spending anyways, it doesn't exactly make much sense to say the deficit is being caused by the tax cuts. For instance, if you have $1 and then go into debt to buy a $2 item, the reason you are in debt is not because you only had $1, but because you tried to spend money you didn't have. So all Rand Paul is doing here is trying to be consistent by arguing against both taxes and spending. It's probably not some plot to keep poor people cleaning the toilets. In fact, I'm pretty sure that what Rand Paul is saying here has to do with the fact that we already had spent and printed a lot of money to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, and doubling down on the spending would just make the inflation that would be upcoming worse. Which, by the way, just looking at the consumer price index for the last year, and it's pretty clear that Rand Paul is correct here. It feels like Hassanabi is trying to build a conspiracy out of what Rand Paul is saying, but he doesn't actually understand government spending and the relation to inflation enough to really bring things together. The sad thing is, Hassan IB isn't wrong that Congress is screwing people over. He's just wrong about how. If you really want to see how Congress is screwing us, I recommend reading up on examples of pork barrel spending, and you will find that much of the spending packages are wrought with corruption. Next up, the Hunter Biden laptop leak. Uh, this, this New York Post story about Hunter Biden's laptop was called fake news from the day it came out to the- But it was, like what? I'm so confused. Like, I think that they, the New York Times and, and all other mainstream outlets, 100% sometimes in unison, purposefully operate as a branch of the government that basically pumps out State Department propaganda. The New York Times didn't cover Hunter Biden foot job uh, and, you know, or, or more importantly, when they covered it, they said that this is uh, not necessarily real or something we can take seriously. Well, that's a little different. Now, I was one of the first people that even argued with the uh, with people in my chat, libs in my chat, about the Hunter Biden laptop. And I told you, it's very likely uh, Hunter Biden's iCloud or some shit getting owned. And there is certainly real footage there after it got owned, being dumped into a hard drive somewhere, and then suspiciously making its way to Rudy Giuliani by way of a QAnon supporting or MacBook repair shop owner. I admit that the information on there was legitimate. It's just what you do with that information is, of course, entirely different. 
if you look at that information and be like hunter biden's doing crack yeah that's real he did or he has a nice cock yeah that's true okay if you saw it he's a nice cock but if you look at that information and say well this proves that he was dealing with ukraine uh and and uh, you know uh, getting joe biden kickbacks from the ukrainian government or some shit or from burisma well no that's false that's literally not true that is demonstrably not true the new york times shouldn't uh say that it is just because it makes you fifis feel better i'm not gonna lie i i'm i'm fairly certain it was russian disinformation <laughs> no 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 <laughs> He tried it. <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, I think it's pretty safe to say that this take from Hassan Abbey did not age well. The New York Times has recently conceded that the information published on the New York Post originally was actually factual. This should be a surprise to no one who actually looked through the original leaks. And this particular take by Hassan Abbey represents the stranger side of BreadTube. He understands that establishment media is not exactly honest. You just saw him fully acknowledge this fact in that clip. So a lot of what Hassan Abbey has just said are points that I would actually agree with. He also acknowledges that the parts of the laptop leak that he doesn't personally care about are likely real. And yet the parts he does, for whatever reason, care about, like the data on Ukraine, he outright denies. Why? Well, he doesn't really give a concrete reason why, other than the strange trend that these bread tubers have where they seem to think that these things are not true until their favorite establishment journalist tells them so. Even when it clearly doesn't make any sense. It's like the libertarian left is so close to realizing that they are being played by these guys. And yet, so far. And now for the last example, repeating the CRT narrative from liberal media. The time critical race theory is literally just like, it's just like whatever the fuck these people have decided critical race theory is. You think they're teaching critical race theory, like actual critical race theory in fucking elementary school? What are you, stupid? That's why I'm having this like broader conversation over it. Critical race theory in the way that Republicans understand it or in the way that like the mainstream media fucking understands it and comprehends it is like, the edge shit that you see, the seminars that you hear about, about like acknowledging my whiteness and privilege. And also on top of that, literally everything that Republicans consider to be history that is uh, accurate for the most part. I the literally American started this conversation class. by talking about like what Republicans have decided critical race theory is. I'm just letting right. you know that like, that's not what it actually is. It's act critical race theory originally is, uh, is a, uh, I think it's a term specifically created for criminal justice and racial disparities and the racial dynamic within the criminal justice system. But that's not what the fuck people are using it for. So I just have to like acknowledge that it's completely bastardized and incorrect now and talk about what Republicans are actually criticizing as critical race theory. Do you get what I'm saying? Like there, that's not being taught in like a fucking elementary school in Georgia. You know what I mean? So the claim that what is being taught in schools has little to do with critical race theory as it is being taught to undergrads in law school is a fairly easy thing to refute. They are basically just claiming that CRT isn't being taught in K-12 education because it's not exactly hyper-specifically literally the same curriculum as what is being taught to undergrads. Instead, what leftists on education boards are trying to push for kids is a dumbed-down version with a more simplified curriculum, but it's still basically CRT. So the whole media narrative that this talking point stems from is just an example of lying by equivocation. The truth is that there are dozens of examples of attempts to teach CRT to kids alongside detailed information on the curriculum. So all Hassan Ibi is doing here is just repeating an easily debunked partisan MSNBC talking point. Anyways, partisan misinformation coming from leftist streamer bros is unfortunately extremely common, and many people have made decent videos exposing this kind of nonsense. Here are a few worthy of mention in regards to Hassan. I don't agree with everything said in these, but for the most part, they are correct. 
And now it's time for the conclusion. Everything I just showed you are just drops in the bucket when it comes to Hassan Abbey and the particular content style he uses. I actually had to cut a lot out just to make sure this wouldn't turn into some hour-long video. I watched about 40 of Hassan Abbey's videos in total and there wasn't a single instance where he wasn't guilty of some noticeable reasoning errors, race baiting, or misinformation. A far cry from my previous episode that focused on ContraPoints, someone who actually is capable of making decent arguments from time to time. That being said, I wouldn't consider Hassan Abbey the worst breadtuber. He is at least genuinely capable of producing some level of content that I can certainly see as appealing to people, especially to those 25 years and under. He also seems to genuinely believe in a lot of the woke socialist takes that he has, in a slightly more palatable but also slightly less intellectual manner as Vosh, effectively making him what I would consider Vosh light. And Hassan does at least call out the corruption that goes on in Washington DC, even if he doesn't fully understand it very well. So there is a small silver lining there. This is why my conclusion is that Hassan Abi is just unironically clueless, but I'm not going to go as far as to call him a terrible person, just very, very horribly misguided. And he actually does have some level of self-awareness on this. I'm not smart, I'm a f himbo. I wear it on my sleeve, you know, I wear it, I say it with my chest, I'm a himbo, I'm not a very smart person. If I were to face Ben Shibino in the marketplace of ideas, he would probably run circles around me, he's very fast talker. But unfortunately, in terms of reasoning skills, he is definitely the least intelligent bread tuber. 100%. No way in hell could anyone exist that is both this popular and yet worse at critical thinking than Hassan. Absolutely not. Someone like that possibly couldn't ex- Well, if you're a libertarian, allegedly, chances are you will be against programs such as affirmative action, state welfare, anti-discrimination legislation. Now, do we see a pattern here? In general, it seems to me that far-righters and libertarians have an awful lot in common. And that's because they both believe in this thing called personal responsibility. Oh yeah, that guy. This'll be fun. But as far as Hasanabi goes, that's all I have to say for now. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe, share, and all that. Or if you really liked it, feel free to toss a nickel or two in my tip jar. Till next time.